Hello, this is Dr. Missick, and in one of my previous videos I recently uploaded, I was talking about how that Saudi Arabia has been financing these School of Islamic Studies in Yale and Princeton and Harvard and Oxford, spending probably hundreds of millions of dollars to encourage the study of Islam in Western academia. And as a result, uh, we have you know, these scholars that are coming out of this, such as Yasser Qadi, who are now talking about holes in the narrative, holes in the Islamic narrative, which are causing Muslims to lose faith and are actually crumbling the very foundations of Islam. So Yasser Qadi, if you want to watch his video explanation of this, uh, he discusses things that shook his faith when he's studying, when, when, when Islam is subjected to historical, archaeological, and scientific scrutiny, all of a sudden we see these holes in the narrative when you study Islam in an academic setting. And this caused a crisis of faith for Yasser Qadi, and he's been vocal about this recently, and this has actually shook the entire Islamic world. So what I'm going to do in this short video is talk about, briefly, what these holes in the narrative, the traditional Islamic narrative, that Yasser Qadi is talking about that caused him to question his faith and are causing thousands or perhaps eventually millions of Muslims to leave the Islamic religion. So first off, let's look at what Yasser Qadi had to say. Now, as for the issue itself, Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Ulum al-Qur'an that the most difficult topics are Ahruf and Qira'at and the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Uthmanic Mus'haf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the Qira'at to the Ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. And this is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qira'at caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. I mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. My first year at okay. Yale. It wasn't a crisis of faith, by the way. So I was very clear about this. People misinterpreted. It was a crisis of my understanding of knowledge. It was a crisis okay. of what my teachers taught me. Alhamdulillah, from alhamdulillah, as somebody who memorized the Quran as a teenager, alhamdulillah, in my entire life, I have never doubted that the Quran is divine. You cannot doubt that. Any, you listen okay. to it, you recite it, you just cannot doubt that. It's never been an issue. This was the issue. That... The issue of ahruf and preservation and qira'at and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. These issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the qira'at are and who understand yeah. some of these questions that are being so, raised. So, Traditional you... understandings of Ahruf and Qira'at cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Qur'an. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit, and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. You know? These are now well known within the Western uh, Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be you know, 100 years ago. You know? And by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, 
of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. And this is something all of us that are in academia fully acknowledge. We actually have issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. It takes a while. I can't answer this question in a 20 minute interview, nor is yeah, it okay, wise okay. to do so, which is why I never brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots, and they are idiots, wallahi. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya akhi. It's not wise. You don't understand qiraat, let it be. It's wise. That's why I never did it. It's and the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. Twitter has so many accounts of Quran experts, and they're non-Muslims, and they're just saying things. Let me as ask you one question to try and make this as specific as possible, I think. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference. Would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that the I think Quran this should be an Quran. easy yes or no, though. Yes, Al Khadi. I, I hey, have to. Okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yeah. open with advanced students. But these issues should not... Look, it is Kalamullah, what is going to be written. It is Kalamullah. What, it is what, what, what would you write? Uh, 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 let's you not... Let, let's, you, you're pushing me. And I'm saying it's not hikmah to... Listen, I have a condition. Like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. All right, we're going to look at two big holes. And the first hole is there's no historical evidence for the existence of Islam, surprisingly enough, until almost the year 700. So Muhammad supposedly died in the year 632, and Islam, there's no evidence from the early Islamic leaders, supposedly. And it, it makes us question that perhaps the earliest, uh, this wasn't a Muslim empire. Perhaps uh, Islam, as we know it, developed over the decades or perhaps even over centuries, as it was crafted by these Arab leaders to suit their needs, especially by uh, Caliph Maliki, who lived uh, rule from 685 to 705. So let's look at what Tom Holland, Tom Holland is a British historian, and he made this discovery, and there's a documentary he produced where he discusses this issue about the origins the mystery, the origins of Islam. My name's Tom Holland. I'm a historian, I write about ancient empires, so Persian, Greek, Roman empires. And now I want to write about the most influential of all the ancient empires, the empire founded by the Arabs in the seventh century, the empire that gave us Islam. I thought that it would be a relatively simple matter. It's been said that Islam was born in the full light of history. But when I began on the project, I discovered that that wasn't actually the case at all. When it comes to Islam's beginnings, there is no full light of history, only a kind of darkness. And when you start looking, everything seems up for grabs. So basically what happened is Tom Holland is a historian and he's written on great empires of the past, Sparta and other Greek civilizations on Rome. And he wanted to turn his hand towards the study of early, early Islam. So he wanted to look at contemporaneous evidence for Islam. And there isn't any. Shockingly enough, there is none until the first time we see Islam as we know it today is in a coin uh, minted by uh, Caliph al-Malaki in the year 695. And interestingly enough, he has a coin he minted in the year 695 looks like a very pagan coin where he has an image of himself and supposedly Muslims don't believe in, in images so this caliph it looks like a pagan coin where he has an image of himself minted on the coin and then a couple of years later we have the shahada in Arabic on the coin some people say that the Apostle Paul is the real founder of Christianity of course I don't believe that but there's reasons to believe that Caliph al-Maliki is the real founder of Islam so the interesting thing, let's, let's go back to me as a historian. So I got a history degree. And what I learned to do as a historian is history is the study of primary sources, right? 
We want to get contemporary evidence. So we don't have any in the 600s. There's nothing for, about Muhammad. There's nothing about Islam. People who are encountering the Arab invading armies, they don't describe them as being Muslim at all. And like I said, surprisingly enough, you have the, the supposed diplomatic correspondence of the caliphs. They're not mentioning Islam at all. And on earlier Islamic coins, there's not the Shahad or anything like that. They just have Bisma Allah in the name of God. Nothing about Muhammad, uh, nothing about Islam that doesn't appear too late, uh, until later. So how does Tom Holland do, deal with this where in about the first hundred years of, of Islamic history or the Arab imperial history, Islam doesn't appear. And finally, in the late years, around the year 700, then we, we see, you know, Islam as we know it today starting to emerge and develop. Uh, so what did he, how he dealt with this is like, okay, here's an issue. There's a book I recommend called The Death of the Prophet. And it describes how contemporary evidence states that Muhammad invaded the Holy Land and that he was alive in the year 634. When Muslim sources say he died in the year 632. So how does Tom Holland deal with that? And he says, well, what happened is the Muslims needed to craft a biography of a prophet, and they decided to use the story of, of uh, Moses. They say that, that uh, Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. We know that Moses wasn't able to lead the people into the promised land. Uh, he had some battles, but it was Joshua that, that uh, initiated the conquest. So that's how the Muslims wanted to tell their story of, of Muhammad, is that he uh, led his people to precipice, and then Abu Bakr led him on to victory in the foundation of the Islamic Empire, or the Arab Empire that became an Islamic after several decades, according to historical evidence. So Tom Holland believes that these, these stories were crafted over decades uh, to serve the interests of the Islamic community, especially in creating a legal system, jurisprudence, because the Persians had an old legal system, ancient civilization, and so the Byzantines, the Roman Empire, and the Arabs are starting from scratch. So the Arabian rulers uh, had the stories of Muhammad and the, Hadith, the Quran, the Hadith, and the Surah crafted to serve their needs to create a legal system so they could administer this great empire. And one of the things they wanted was a sacred scripture in uh, in Arabic, because you had this uh, Roman Empire, they had the Greek scriptures for these people, they wanted a uniquely Arab civilization, so they crafted a religion. So the question is, who was Muhammad? How much of the stories that the Muslims tell are true? Tom Allen also deals with one of the most scandalous question, uh, stories about Muhammad, where Muhammad marries a six-year-old girl and uh, deflowers her when she's nine. The story from the Hadith is that Aisha was playing with little girls. She herself was a little girl. She's nine years old. She's playing with toys in the backyard with girl, these little girls together. And she sent out like the Prophet would like to see you. So she's taken to the Prophet. He um, deflowers her. We'll put it that way. So we look at it today. It looks kind of shocking. And Tom Holland said, well, that story was crafted. It's not necessarily historically true because Aisha is Abu Baker's daughter, and this brings him into, Abu Baker is the, the, the first caliph that succeeded Muhammad, and that gives him legitimacy, that he just didn't marry his daughter as, a, as an adult, but as a child, to ensure her virginity, that she had even had her first period, according to these sources, uh, when she's deflowered, to, to show that she's a virgin uh, wife, of Muhammad, her, his favorite wife, uh, the very daughter of the first caliph, Abu Bakr. So, but does that help Islam? First off, the story is scandalous. Secondly, uh, does that really help to say the story is not true, right? If the hadith, the hadith is not true, in that instance, then what else is not true? So if they just made the story up, uh, what else did they make up? And Tom Holland believes that quite a bit. He dismisses the historical reliability of the, the Quran and the Hadith, saying that it was developed over a period of time and started as some being a symbol of the form where we know it, I guess in the late, the very, very late 600s, early 700s, uh, to serve the purpose of the Arab rulers, who at that time uh, crafted the religion into Islam. 
In the book, The Death of the Prophet, it looks at the actual evidence, contemporary evidence, where uh, the Arab conquest is described very differently by you know, first-hand testimony by people living in that period who don't mention or describe things that are in the, the, the Islamic sources. So that's very interesting. But that book, and there's a lot of evidence for believing this, saying that you know, Muhammad himself wasn't really a Muslim, that he was uh, a millennial prophet. He's predicting that the end of the world is coming very soon. And uh, he created an Abrahamic religion. He's trying to create a religion where Jews and Christians and his followers can, can come together. Later on, it developed into Islam and excluded Christians and Jews. But these sources show in the Quran itself, well, there is a big focus on the Day of Judgment and last days in the Quran. You can read it yourself. So I think that the author of the Death of the Prophet is on to something. And the strong Jewish influence, it seems like, Marginalized people were attracted to Muhammad, the Jewish people, and uh, Gnostic Christians. And that's why what we see in the Quran is a derivative book that is derived from the Jewish Midrash and Christian apocryphal gospels. But it could be that in the late uh, 600, early 700s, that uh, these scribes just uh, borrowed from these texts to craft the Quran. What needs to happen is we need to look at the, the, the best way to discover who Muhammad really was, if he existed at all, is to do a deep dive into contemporary historical narratives that describe it. I think that's where we're going to find the truth. And then we should judge the Hadith and the Quran itself in light of what we find the first people who record Islam, or mostly non-Muslim sources, what they say about it, instead of sources that are written 100 to 200 years after this, the time of uh, 632 to 634 when this prophet uh, lived. So first off, there's just an empty space in the life of Muhammad and contemporary evidence uh, from the time of the early Islamic conquest con contradicts the Islamic account. And uh, when I studied history in college, you know, that's the best sources, right? Contemporary first-hand sources instead of trusting in something that was written over 100 to 200 years later. So that's the problem, is there's a lack of primary sources, and the primary sources we do have say something altogether different, contradicting the traditional Islamic sources that are written much later. So how did Tom Holland deal with this? He thinks that Islam was crafted and invented several decades, almost a century after the death of whoever this prophet was. And these Sir ancient Syriac Aramaic sources seem to indicate that there was a prophet. We don't really know a lot about him yet. We're going to have to ask these hard questions to try to see if we can reconstruct history. Uh, but a lot of his people who were following him were not following him because they necessarily believed in the religion. They were following him to rape and pillage and to enrich themselves uh, in raiding and attacking and, and going on these, uh, these raids. So Muhammad went up there supposedly in the area uh, you know, spreading, attacking, and, and looting, and raiding, and these Arabs accompanied him, not because they believed in his religion, but because they wanted to share in the booty. And then later on, apparently decades later, uh, the, the, these Arab rulers started to promote this religion that they crafted, probably might have, not have much resemblance to what this uh, early Arabian prophet said, to serve the purposes of the Arab Empire. So and then they started to promote, they crafted and they promoted the Islamic religion. So it's a late development and it probably doesn't represent whatever this uh, Arabian prophet was who we call Muhammad, whoever the historical person this religion is based on. I mean, it's just, we need to look at, at history. And this is, this history is contradicting what the Hadith says. So this is something that, that historians haven't begun to look at until recently. And I think Tom Holland's doing a good job in that. So number one, we see that for the first 100 years, there's no evidence that Islam existed. And the first uh, evidence we have of Islam is that coin, the gold coin by uh, Caliph al-Malaki, um, where we see the Shahada for the first time. It's amazing, isn't it? You'd think there'd be more historical evidence, but the evidence seems to indicate that Islam, the, the story of Muhammad and the Quran was developed or crafted uh, by decade after decade until it came to the form we have today. So the second hole in the narrative is the Quran itself. 
Muslims are, have been taught until recently that there's only one Quran, and wherever you go around the world, all Qurans are exactly the same. Even the diacritical marks, which weren't, wouldn't have been in the original Quran, are all the same wherever you go. So Hatun Tash, she's a Turkish convert to Christianity. She's gone around the, the Arab world. She went to religious bookstores, and she bought 30 Qurans, and every single Quran is different from the other, and they have 90,000 variations between them. They're, they're, they're still counting. There's probably going to be hundreds of thousands of variations. And we have Dr. Brubaker, I think his name is. He's got a site called The Variant Quran, where he's showing we're probably going to find hundreds of thousands of variants in the Quran soon. He's putting this channel just showing that there's all kinds of, if you look at the oldest Quran manuscripts, and beyond that, we have no Quran manuscript from the 600s. Left. We have Bibles older than that, but no Quran. And uh, they did find, uh, in, in Yemen, they found this, the Sanaa Quran. What happened is Caliph Uthman, supposedly, he tried to standardize the Quran. So they had that problem back then where there's all kinds of different Qurans. So he tried to create one Quran for all Muslims. And there's debate about that. Some people didn't like his version of the Quran. And uh, they found in a storage area in the dome of a mosque uh, one of these Qurans that uh, survived the destruction. And of course, it has significant variations in the text. Um, and then beyond that, we have uh, John of Damascus, an early, one of the early church, actually later, one of the later of the early church fathers. And he's the, the, one of the first people who described Islam as we know it, mostly, right? Because I think. Islam is still in development in the time of John of Damascus. And he lived from six, uh, 676 to, uh, to 749. And he's quoting from the Quran. He's describing a book called The Camel of God, a chapter in the Quran called the, a surah called The Camel of God. Well, The Camel of God is mentioned in the Quran, but it's not a surah anymore. So I think that uh, John of Damascus probably had a different Quran in front of him than what we had today. Uh, so that shows that the, the Quran is still evolving and the biography of Muhammad is still evolving. One of the interesting things that John Damascus says is that the Kaaba, and, and he, I don't know if he describes this as being in, in Mecca, but they have the Kaaba and they have the Black Stone. He says the Black Stone is actually an idol of Kubar, the goddess Venus, the sex goddess. And Muslims at that time were saying that that Abraham, you know, he's not able to have children, so he takes Hagar, and they make love on top of a statue of Aphrodite or Venus, an Arabian sex goddess. So he, he takes this idol, and he puts it underneath him, and he gets on it, and he has sex with uh, Hagar. That enables him, since I guess the divine power of the sex goddess, enables Abraham to uh, impregnate Hagar. So <laughs> that's what Muslims were teaching and saying. Uh, that's why the, the black stone was important. And John Damascus says at, the, at his time, you looked at the black stone, it was, a, it was an idol. It was a carved idol, uh, a statue of uh, the god that they would uh, uh, see as the equivalent to Venus, the sex goddess. So uh, we see the Quran life of Muhammad evolved over the decades. Uh, so what are Muslims going to do about all this information? So what happens is they take, you know, Saudi Arabia pays for Islam to be studied in these universities, so they use the academic methods and historical scrutiny, and then we see these giant holes, and we find that Islam evolves and it's changed uh, by uh, rulers in the early Arab empires that were becoming Muslim. They were developing and inventing this religion. So, so what do Muslims do about that? Is that any comfort? So, like I mentioned before, the story of well. Tom Holland saying, well, maybe they just made the story up about Aisha to show that, that uh, Abu Bakr was the heir of Muhammad because, after all, Muhammad himself married his daughter and she was pure as a virgin because she hadn't even had her first period. So, so that's uh, Tom Holland says, well, that story was just invented. So, like I said, if you, the, uh, the life of Muhammad is considered, he's the perfect example for all mankind. And the, the Hadith are, since that's true and from a Muslim point of view, uh, the hadith, these these uh, these hadith, which are considered dependable and authentic, uh, they're the basis of Islam today. A lot of Islamic practices come from the hadith. So, <laughs> if the hadith were just invented, um, what are Muslims to do? 
if that story is invented, how many other stories are invented? All of them? What, what do we know about Muhammad? Very little, apparently. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. Right now, what they do is when Hatun Tosh comes to Speaker's Corner at Hyde Park in, in England, and they see her coming to ask these questions, uh, they close up shop and, shop and they run away from her as fast as they can. That's the solution they have right now. I think the left has been coddling Islam for a long time. And I think these are valid questions for a historian, and we should be able to uh, investigate them, let the pieces fall where they may. And, uh, you know, Christians have, have dealt with, you know, the biblical archaeology and textual criticism, we've dealt with these questions openly and honestly uh, for centuries. If you look at the historical record of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, it seems to be historically reliable. Uh, but there's a lot of things we know about the historical Jesus, but what do we know about the, the historical Muhammad, if, if that even was his name? So, leftists need to stop coddling Muslims, right? What's happened is Yosef Qadi has, like Toto, he's pulled the curtain back, and, and now we see the what the wizard really is. Not this big, scary man, but a, a head floating in there with fire and smoke, but a, a doddering old man, a man. So the curtain's been pulled back, the, the lie has been exposed. So where do you go from there? And uh, I think that we need to look at the truth and find the facts. Thanks to Saudi Arabia in financing these institutes of higher education and, his, and applying historical scrutiny to Islam, now the very foundations of Islam are collapsing. And what we need to do, I think as historians, is to look at the facts and see if we can reconstruct what really happened. And apparently it's not going to match the traditional Muslim narratives which were developed centuries later. So these are the two holes in the narrative. Number one, <laughs> there's a big gapping hole where there's no evidence that even Islam even existed uh, for the first almost hundred years of the Islamic Empire. Secondly, the Quran was revised and changed again and again throughout history. And even now, there are well over 30, maybe as many as 38 different Qurans with tens of thousands of variations and alternate readings between them. So those are the facts, and they're exposed in two holes. So it's the best option well, to know the way, the truth, and the life, to come and place faith in Jesus Christ and escape falsehood and error and come to the truth. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and Jesus is the expression of the love of God.